Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is going to be a little bit uh, convoluted in a sense that I wanted to go back and uh, just review a couple of things that we did last time in regards to the goal area and in regards to uh, penalty throws and uh, taking a, a, a look at a little, a few clips, etc. So I'll start off, and as you all can see, inside the goal area, an attacking player in the goal area cannot be in front of the line of the ball at any time. If a pass into or within the goal area flies forward toward the goal line, ahead of the receiving player, an ordinary foul must be called, even if the passing and receiving players were at the same line at the moment of the pass. This is especially important to apply in a player advantage. And you can see from the diagram, it's pretty straightforward. And again, you use the center line of the head as your reference point. So um, somebody that's inside that two area cannot receive or be led the pass. That pass is going to have to go straight to them. And then from there, uh, they can score or attempt, et cetera. So that, that's important. And again, the center line of the heads and everything is good. Anything forward, not good. Um, take this down a little bit. Boy. I am having trouble today. Oh, I see. Save. You'll have to excuse me. Um, <laughs> this is not, I had, I had everything all set up and now all of a sudden I get a, uh, a little curveball thrown my way. Okay, here we go. It shall not be an offense if a player takes the ball into the goal area and passes it to another player who is behind the line of the ball who shoots at the goal immediately before the first player has been able to leave the goal area. If the player receiving the ball, receiving the pass, does not shoot at the goal, the player who passed the ball must immediately leave the goal area to avoid being penalized under the rule. Referees should not penalize an attacking player who momentarily enters the goal area without interfering with the play. If the player continues to stay there, the player is affecting play by their very presence as that player is forcing a, ch a change in how or where the defense plays and the foul should be called. So it's pretty much straightforward and, and clear. And I have a clip here we can take a quick look at. And let me get this on the screen as big as possible. Hey, Ed, question on that. Um, yeah. So if a shot is taken and there is a player on the edge of the box, and as the shot is taken, the player enters the box prior to the ball entering to go towards the goal. The ball then is hit, the goalie blocks it, the ball then drops in front of said player who's now able to get a rebound. Is that, is that technically inside the two or should play, should you let play go and call a goal if it's scored? At that point in time, there's not enough time for that other player to leave the, the uh, goal area. And we had, uh, and I'll, after we run this one here, I'll see if I can find the clip that uh, shows where a goal was scored exactly that way. The rebound okay. came and it went right back to the player that actually shot the ball. There was a player inside the two, but that player didn't have any, any time to exit the two because the shot on the rebound came immediately. So therefore the goal was allowed. That player was not affecting 
uh, the defense in any way. So that that's what the interpretation we had last time and, and we talked about. Uh, let's take a look at this and see what we can see. Yeah. Yeah, unless there is a golden opportunity. We're safe for Richmond on the down to four. I would love to be in five foot. So the servers have to back by the goal first. Well, then it's a good job. I'm not going to do this. Dyer said, baby. Okay, there's a lot we can learn from this uh, and and try to speculate uh, or simulate what possibly could happen. Now, as we bring this, you can see where the affected player is. Now, this pass, if this pass is in line with these two players head to head, it's okay. But if this ball is going to go forward and lead this player, that's not okay. And this ball got tipped by the goalie, which you'll see here momentarily. You can see where the ball is. Now, That if the goalie hadn't tipped that and the ball went over here, that would be illegal because it is a forward pass and it's leading this player coming into the two-meter area. But as it was, it all turned out okay. Now, the referees at that particular point in time, if this referee saw that that was a forward pass, that ball should have been turned over right away. Uh, even though the goalie tipped the ball because he's offside and inside the two, and he stays inside the two as the ball is out here. But they just let it play through uh, because the other team has control of the ball, so they weren't interrupting the game flow, basically. And away they go on a counterattack. Okay, now let me see. Does that answer your question? I I think what I'm referencing is let's say that the shot is taken at the six and there's a player at the two right in front of the goal. And as the ball is shot, that player swims into the two and basically meets the rebound in the two. Are they technically not legal because – they're in they're they're beating the shot or depends upon where the ball is. I mean if the ball is shot and it goes inside the two and, and then they go that and he follows that shot inside the two, he's not offside. Right. Yes. I think and that's what that's what I was trying to understand is if if that technically would be legal or if or if we have to take in the fact that it's a shot when the ball is released, no one has possession. Can they go inside the two at that point? You just follow where the ball is and relative to the defender. Relative to the defender's head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, you figure it out from there. I appreciate that. That was the clarification I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. Not a problem. All right. One thing we didn't cover, uh, free throws. Basically, we didn't uh, talk too much about free throws the last time. Free shall be taken at the location of the ball, which hasn't changed. If the foul is committed by a defending player within the defender's goal area, the free throw shall be taken outside the goal area. So he can exit forward or he can exit sideways. Either way, it's legal. And just reviewing some of the, uh, the rules regarding free throws. Time to take the free throw shall be reasonable without undue delay. The ball must be put in play by demonstrating a clear separation of ball, hand, and water. As in passing the ball, picking it up, dropping the ball, and dropping the ball, picking it up, and dropping the ball. 
tossing the ball in the air, swimming with the ball, or transferring the ball from one hand to the other hand above the water. And some of the common ways to interfere or improperly take a free throw intentionally to throw the ball away or fail to release the ball. And you should be particularly sensitive to that. A lot of times that uh, foul will be called and that defensive player will just kind of ease the ball off. And that is illegal. If they touch the ball in any way and move that ball away from the uh, player awarded the free throw, that is not legal. Uh, play the ball before it has left the hand of the thrower. Uh, the defender staying too close, and by too close, uh, Amber has kind of uh, described the bread basket, so your nose to your outreach of your hands where they join, and if you extend that out, that's a pretty good area in which uh, to kind of keep in the back of your mind. If I have the ball up and dry and I am allowed to be able to rotate left, rotate right, to be able to see where I'm going to throw in a reasonable amount of time. Putting the ball in play, a lot of times players are going to be spinning the ball in their hand and that is not legal. I mean, basically you have to see Clear separation, ball, hand. Um, you want to be careful about defenders staying too close, holding so the player can't move away, either offensively or defensively. Uh, offensive uh, advancing without putting the ball in play. Uh, sometimes uh, if you're not paying real close attention, that player will take the liberty of on a direct shot of moving forward before they release the ball. And that is not a direct shot. Uh, just like on a penalty shot, if you line up that shooter on the penalty shot and he's right on the line, he picks the ball up on the whistle and he leans forward and starts to move forward. That's illegal. So the same thing would hold true on a uh, on a free throw. Uh, defender closing the gap uh, prior to the ball being released. Self-explanatory. Defender raising an arm hand without moving back. They've got to move back if they want to raise their hand up or arm. Uh, okay, attacking player from behind within six meters. It shall be a penalty foul for a defending player to foul or impede from behind an attacking player who has the ball and an open path to the goal within the six meter area, regardless of whether the player is holding the ball. The only way a defender can defend in this situation is to touch only the ball or hand holding the ball. If the defending player's actions prevent the attacking player from continuing the action, the penalty must be called. Note it does not uh, note that this does not constitute an automatic penalty. Um, the defending player's actions have to prevent the attacking player from continuing the action for a penalty to be called. And we'll take a, a look at a couple of clips here and uh, analyze them as far as uh, Calling. Uh, just keep in mind the player should be facing the goal. The player should have an open path to the goal, except for the opposing goalkeeper. The player should have control of the ball. And if that control of the ball is taken away, then there's your penalty foul. If he still has control of the ball, you can wait to try to see if he's going to be able to score a natural goal. Uh, because if he has control, then he has the opportunity to take a shot. We would really like to see a natural goal if possible, but we don't want to wait too long so that we get ourselves into a worse situation. But we don't also want to be automatic and just blow the whistle right away and say, oh, that's a penalty foul. The second defender is not in a position to cut off the pathway. That is your your fourth factor that you uh, 
consider. Now, I got a lot of uh, clips here that I took from the Princeton Harvard game. And uh, we can take a look at this first clip here, which is a penalty foul. And it's off a rebound. This was right at the very beginning of the game. Uh, Easton and uh, and Corey did a very nice job. Hey, inside Johnson has it on a redirect rebound, and a five meter is coming for Princeton. It was a really nice save by Kenneth Burtak, the shot out. Okay. Oh. Okay, here's your shot outside, and uh, this is a good example of the question that was asked. The shot's taken from outside. This player is not quite, uh, it's, it's probably right on the two-meter line. It's, it's, it's hard to judge with a video taken from this angle. But the referee is right on that two-meter line, so he can see. And the rebound comes. And since the ball is ahead of this player, this player now is able to move in. And perfectly legal. And now he has control of the ball at this particular point in time and is trying and attempting to get a shot off, and he's being fouled. So therefore, the penalty. Okay, we'll take a look at another penalty here. Second period, Harvard with the ball. Harvard is in white, Princeton's in the dark caps. Going to get another opportunity. In fact, a better opportunity than that. Okay, there's an example of your full turn. Now, for a right hander to turn in this direction, it's pretty easy with a defender on his back uh, to make that full turn. It's a lot more difficult to go the other way. So, you want to be aware of that in game situations, it has to be a full turn. Not a quarter turn, not three quarters of a turn, but a full turn. He has, still has control of the ball here, and defenders are fouling, therefore penalty foul. Um... Okay, here's a, I, I suppose you'd say this was controversial in the sense it's it's harder to judge dry passes into the two meter area. Was that pass catchable? Um, and it is five meter one Okay, you can see if you take it back, you can see how close to the goal line the offensive player is through the ball. So it's going to be very difficult for the player that drove in and got the inside water here. Uh, this line looks like it's a good line, so that in order for that to be a forward pass, that ball would have to be. Well, probably right in this area here. So this looks right from the very beginning. It looks pr pretty legal. And then as we take it through, of course, he never has a chance to go up to get the ball. So, I mean, you've got to call the penalty foul there. Maybe that has maybe that pass was a little bit high, but but the way he was held, you'll never know. And that's a probable goal if he could receive that ball. Um, 
a very likely goal, actually. And here's one more. Back to about where we were. 6.35 to go in the fourth quarter. Even strength. Shot clock is at 10 seconds. Couple of big four times. Pops up. Another at first year working out there with Daniel Sackle of Sir and Five Fields up for the Princess Tigers. Yeah, great entry for Bob to beat him, sir. Okay, does that meet all the factors? It's a good pass in, makes the turn. The only question, the only question you would have in, in trying to evaluate this was, does he have control? Does he have enough control and opportunity here for a probable goal? And that's pretty close. I, I can see that going either way. Uh, my apologies. Sorry about that. And I must have done something wrong. Okay, so everybody can see my screen. All right, control over conduct. Um, if a player, coach, or bench personnel is issued a red card, the individual must leave the venue, remain out of sight and sound, and is prohibited from any communication or contact, direct or indirect, with the team, coaches, and or bench personnel un until the completion of the contest, including overtime periods. And the exception is the athletic trainer. So that's a change. They have to be completely gone and no communication whatsoever. Now that's not for a misconduct. Misconduct, they have to sit on the bench with a cap on, but it also applies to a flagrant misconduct or fighting. So that that is basically new. Uh, hey, Ed, just a quick yeah. question on that as far as the reporting part. Um, I know we got an email from, from Dan and Michael about reporting those immediately. Once a game misconduct or a red card is issued, does Michael and Dan need to get a text or a call after the game? Obviously not during the game, but after the game um, in a certain amount of time um so that they're aware of it or is that just filed in the head referee report within the 24 hours just so i sorry rookie on the east coast trying to get clarity uh no i should be reported immediately okay thank you and, and to dan in particular anytime there's a, an injury uh anytime there's a serious problem with uh with the facilities uh, anytime there is a, uh, a flagrant misconduct fighting, um, that has to be reported to Dan. That should be, you should uh, have his number and give him a call. And if he doesn't answer, leave him a voicemail, at least so he has it. Because there's nothing like coming into the office early in the morning on Monday uh, and getting a call from somebody unrelated or related to the issues and well, did you see what happened, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. That's a lot easier to deal with if he knows ahead of time exactly what happened. So that's all part of the communication part at the end of this uh, session. Sorry sorry to jump it, but I just wanted to get clear, clarity. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I appreciate it. Um. And this is new, and I've got a, a clip that we'll take a look at uh, right after this. Uh, when there is a counterattack, a player with a position of advantage does not have to give up the advantage to go to the ball, make the free throw, 
the player on the team who is next closest to the ball can take the free throw as long as there is no undue delay. So it's up to you to make the judgment call as far as the undue delay. And as you can see in the diagram here, this player obviously has an advantage for the counterattack, and, and this player is closest to the ball but can take off and go. And this player now can move up and take the free throw where the ball lies. And uh, wouldn't you know, but this happens. And we're going to take this, I think, yes. This is the clip. Now, there are several things, and, and I have at least four points that I considered in looking at this particular clip. See if you can identify all four points uh, as you review this clip. You can see where the ball is at the start. Referee one, referee two is on the perimeter on the far side. You got the bench, you got the coach. So there are four takeaways. And I'll show that I'll run this through twice and, and make no comment, and then we can stop and talk about it. <laughs> okay, one more time. See if you can pick out the four kind of points of emphasis, maybe. <laughs> Okay, here's what I took away from this. Four particular points. One, positioning of the referees was good. They had radio headsets. I'm not sure how they or if they communicated uh, exactly what was uh, was going or who was responsible for what. Um, that's that's one thing that I, I took away from this. And you can see uh, perimeter referee here. He's He's got a situation where he has the ball here, but he also has uh, two sets of players right in through here. So he's got to have, you know, pretty good control and, and pretty good peripheral vision to pick up everything. And this particular referee has is, is got his area of uh, three sets of players, so to speak. Three defenders, two offensive players. So we take it a little bit further. All right, the ball gets passed over to the far side. So you can see the referee looking across on the far side. And it looks like uh, the referee, front court referee, is in a good position to see what is relative here. You know what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to get the ball into set, or they're going to try to get a driver coming in here and get him available and open. So you have an idea of what's going to happen. Now, sure enough, this particular player, and here's the second point, commits an offensive foul on the drive by going over to the defense. And that, that looks like that was a, a very good call by the perimeter referee. Although you might argue that this defensive player moved in front of the offensive player. Um, and I could see somebody, you know, uh, reasoning that uh, maybe that wasn't a legitimate driving offensive. But anyway, so there it is. Now, so he calls it. And as soon as he calls it, the ball is right here. 
and the player's going to let go. Okay, next, next point of emphasis right here. That player is entitled to take off. He has the advantage. The next player in line is allowed to, if I get my pointer up here, wherever it disappeared to, oh, here it is. A second player is allowed to come up and take the free throw, which he does. Now, to me, that's a that's an offensive turnover right there because he goes right into the defender and uh, and basically buries him. But that didn't get called. So now we have a situation. Okay, the free throw comes, and here the ball goes up but you can see that it never leaves his hand. So that defender gets away with it, picks up the ball and scores. And the last point of emphasis, look where the coach is. Now, understandably, the coach is very upset. And the coach is now approaching the referee and interfering with the game. And that's something that you don't want to see and you don't want to allow have happen. And he'll even, he was requested to go back, but he still comes out and he starts to complain to the referee. This is where communication, if you have headsets on, you can hear what's, what's going on on that side of the pool if you're the perimeter referee. And this is the opportunity for you to help your partner out. You can immediately card that red coat, uh, that that coach, uh, give him a uh, whatever card he deserves, and uh, so that he understands that hey, this is not this is during actual game situation, and it's not a timeout, and it's not in between a period, and you are not allowed to come out on the deck like that and have confrontation with the official. So those are the points. That I had, they did a good job. They picked up on the offensive uh, turnover. The ball goes over to the far side. Uh, they didn't catch the offensive player burying the uh, Fordham defender. Uh, a free throw was taken legally, uh, as the new rule states. And, uh, well, it actually it wasn't taken. The ball was stolen out of his hand, and a goal was scored. They did not allow this goal, by the way. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? Okay, just a quick review on control. This is important for coaches calling timeouts. A player has control of the ball if the player is holding the ball or if the ball is in reach and that player is clearly in the best position to determine what happens to the next, to the ball next. And in the past, I've had situations which have come up where nobody was near the player with the ball, but the ball was not in the, in the player's hand and they called a timeout and it turned into a penalty shot. Illegal, illegal calling a timeout. Uh, correctable uh, clock area error. We had a situation at the Princeton game where this actually happened. Um, and let me see if I get the. Let's see if this is it. It was three nothing. A chance to go back up by that margin again here. Oko dish is off. Lefty pass from Payouts. He's coming up big time around six meters. Might have won exclusive. Yes. Six on five. Now for the Tigers. Third. Nah, that's the wrong clip. Sorry. Uh, improper ball in play. Well, here's an example from uh, 
You'll have to excuse me. I have so many clips that sometimes I get lost. Max Warren's detection. Passing it back out to the top of the pool. Rises. Ooh. Rises up. That's a turnover by Fordham. Okay, that's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. You can't uh, start waving the ball around up in the air. That's not considered putting the ball in play. That's not the proper way of taking a free throw. Ball turns right. It's a turnover by Fordham. We pass tip, uh, improper ball in play. I guess I don't. Oh, I know where it is. Here it is. Bear with me. Six Very exciting game, by the way. Princeton Harvey. That one all the way. That's the position you want to be in. Average goaltender when a lot of stuff. All right. At this particular point in time, the ball turns over, and you'll notice the player right here. Two players right here. Uh, he's actually going to kick off the Princeton player and gets called for it. You can always tell if there's an action, there's always a reaction, and you can see the reaction in the defending players. Pretty clear-cut call. Now, what happened after this, Princeton calls a timeout so they can go down and they can set up on a six and five. All of a sudden, the referees go to the desk. The desk alerted them. Apparently, the clock was not reset appropriately prior to this happening. So it took them a while to sort things out. But what they had to do is they had to take What's up, Sean? the ball back to the point where yeah, the clock was not reset. This exclusion does not count. Uh, the timeout is timeout does not count. And they resume play from Golden back Gold. there. So and unfortunately, uh, Princeton lost play. the opportunity the for a six and five the friends. because of their error. The shallow okay. deep pull or sun factor flip for ends. What's that? No, flip. Yes, the visiting team needs to pick. The, unless they're happy where they're at. Okay, if they're happy, with, if there's no shallow deep pool, right? No. But yeah, but no shallow deep pool. Yeah, three minutes, put three minutes on the game clock. Okay, if they've already used their one timeout in overtime, they don't get no more timeouts. The 30 second carries over. Right. They did not lose that timeout. So if they already use the one and they only get one in overtime, they don't get carryovers and regular timeouts. Yeah, yeah, but they get they, no, they get one timeout apiece in overtime until the very end. Mike Francis, mute check. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to understand what was going on there. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, this is new as well. Defenders, defending players, including the goalkeeper, to fail to take the correct position during the taking of a penalty throw. Um, it includes the two field players that line up uh, on either side of the player taking the penalty foul. If they don't respond to a warning, uh, and they continue to uh, stay too close and not respond to your directions, you can exclude them. Before, you only could exclude the goalkeeper for failing to stay, keep their head on the goal line. But now you, now you have the, the privilege and the opportunity to uh, extend that to the field players as well. Okay, this is where... I get a little convoluted and uh, 
I wrote down a lot of things. And as far as communication is concerned, we already covered one. And that is the importance of communicating with the CWP office in a timely fashion. Um, but you have communication with coaches, communication with players, uh, with your partner. You've got the headsets now, so that's a good thing. Uh, you want to use that wisely. Uh, with administrators that may happen to be at the game on the club level, uh, your chances are probably not that great uh, in terms of having a, an assistant athletic director that might be in charge of club sports uh, something like that. So you may not have the opportunity to deal with administrators, but you've got the desk, which is extremely important, especially in the club situation. Uh, prior to the game, 30 minutes prior to the game with your partner, it's best to make sure you check in with the desk, talk to them, find out what their knowledge is like, what their experience is like, so you can anticipate if you might have any problems uh, during the game situation. A lot of times it's a learning situation for them. They haven't been put in, a, in that responsibility and it's a learning situation. So especially on the club level, you want to try to help them out as much as you possibly can without distracting from your responsibilities of actually officiating the game. Uh, but if they make an error, it could be costly and uh, it could really slow down the game. Uh, spectators, you're not going to have to, fortunately, I don't think you'll have to deal with that too much. But if there is an administrator around and there are spectators that are uh, being a little bit uh, obnoxious and kind of uh, projecting themselves too much, you can always ask the administrator uh, to uh, talk with those uh, spectators and or invite them to leave the facility. Um, so at any rate, those are the communications that you need to keep in mind. What coaches expect from referees? This is always an interesting question. Um, being a coach myself, Knowledge of the rules was important to me. Clear mechanics, being able to understand what the referee was calling and getting a signal as to what that referee called, whether it be an offensive, whether it be a push off, whether it be a sink uh, in the women's game, whether it be a suit grab, very important. Uh, clear mechanics a clear whistle, a loud whistle, one that everybody can hear, uh, being consistent from the start of the game to the end of the game, uh, player safety, control the level of physicality. Uh, I was always very concerned uh, regarding that uh, from a coaching standpoint. I wanted to make sure my players were protected. Um, uh, be approachable and professional. And that's always a big issue with, with coaches. A lot of times I'll get an evaluation from a coach or a complaint from a coach, well, so-and-so is not approachable. I can't approach him. The bottom line, really, what the coach really wants to see is whether or not the official is going to call the game the way he's been coaching his team. When you come right down to it, uh, I always get a kick out of that because uh, a, a lot of times when you're coaching and you're doing a scrimmage, you have the whistle. And I, I'm not sure about the coaches nowadays. They've got so many assistants, assistants, et cetera, et cetera. So they may not be calling the fouls, but you get into a game situation or a scrimmage situation back and forth. And now you are controlling the scrimmage. So if you're ignoring the rules and allowing your players to get away with certain things like a push off, a, a grab, et cetera, et cetera, well, 
you're not doing a very good job of coaching because what's going to happen when you get in a game situation, you're going to be confronted with your players doing exactly what they did in practice and getting caught because the referees are going to be on top of it. So that's why I say call the game the way their team has been coached. Yeah, I think that happens a lot. And, and sometimes that's where the conflict is. The coaches have a tendency to evaluate the referees. At the same time, they're trying to evaluate the game strategy and the game that their teams are playing. And when you start doing that, you kind of get lost. It's either got to be one or the other. Either you coach your players and take your strategies and what you worked on all week before that game day and see how well they're executing. And then uh, that's about as far as you can really go uh, because you can't have your eyes all over the place, especially when you're down at the far end of the pool and trying to look at your offense and seeing what your offense is doing and what that defense is doing. The two referees, the attack referee and the perimeter referee, have the best seats in the house. So they know exactly what's going on. Um, and you have to have some confidence and faith as a coach that the referees that you're looking at are going to do a good job. But on the same token, I can say the best thing that you can do as an official is be on time, dress properly, be approachable, be a good listener, and be very confident and have a very positive image on the deck. And if you can do all those things, you're not going to have any problems. Well, you may have a problem pop up here and there in a very close game, but if you're confident and you know what you're doing and you have confidence in what you're doing and your communication is good, that's all you can ask for. If a coach comes up and asks you a question, that's one thing. But if a coach comes up to you and makes a statement about a situation, that's something totally different. You don't have to respond to statements. You can always turn around and say, coach, what's your question? And if they come up the wrong time, and I always get a kick out of this. It usually is right after a goal is scored, they have something they want to say to the referee. Well, that's not the appropriate time. Um, good referees that have confidence in, in what they're doing, they can deal with that pretty quickly. They can say, Coach, do you want to call a timeout if you have got a question? Or, Coach, I'll check in with you at the next timeout or at the end of the period. Um, and then you can ask me your question. Um, so some coaches are, ugh, can be very upsetting to a referee because they're always yakking. They always have something they want to say. They always have something they want to complain about. And you have the appropriate tools to deal with that. You've got a warning. And when you give a warning, make sure it's clear that you gave a warning. Um, yellow card, yellow red card, red card. So you've got your whole sequence that you can go through. And don't be afraid to use it. Uh, a lot of times referees that maybe not quite as experienced will allow coaches to go a little bit too far and they get a little bit intimidated. You wanna cut that off right from the very beginning. They have enough levels. You got the warning, the yellow card, the yellow red card before you give the red card. So um, you can communicate quite clearly. Uh, you'll make mistakes. There's no perfect game played or called in water polo. You are making a multitude of split second decisions under stressful conditions. Uh, you can't expect perfection. 
it's a heavy burden. If you make a mistake, understand what happened, see if you were in the best position to make the correction, uh, make the correct call, learn from the situation. Never use a missed call to make up a call later in the game. I haven't seen that for a long time, but in the past, it has occurred. You don't care who wins. Preparation is key. Make sure you know the rules. Go over them. Review them. It's an ongoing task. Something is always going to pop up. It's going to put a question in the back of your mind. Uh, what rule applies there? How should I interpret this? Um, if you have a chance to review game tapes, that is the greatest way to learn. Uh, you can see it on video. You can see what actually happened. And obviously, as we're looking at, at these videos, the angle is different than what the referee's perspective is. So you have to kind of keep that in mind when you take a look at videos. You take a look at the videos and you go, okay, where was I? Was I in the right position? Was I in a good position to see what actually happened? Uh, did I communicate well with my partner on the radio set, on the headsets? Uh, have good body language. Again, that's so important. Uh, it speaks louder than words. Uh, just your appearance on the deck and how you handle yourself going up and down the deck. Uh, it it means, means so much. Uh, anticipate the play, not the call. Um, that's so important. Understand what's coming and adjust your positioning to achieve the best view. Focus on the action. Understand that a particular action can cause a negative or positive reaction. Find the instigator. Respond according to the rules, whether an advantage was gained or lost. Losing focus can lead to the wrong player being penalized, sometimes a no call is your best action when in doubt. So if you see something happen, make sure you saw it from the beginning. Don't respond to the aftermath. Uh, and again, in some of those situations, a no call is the best action because you didn't see what actually happened right from the very beginning. Be professional, you're there to do an impartial job, keep the level of physicality under control, player safety is the top priority. And you're communicating with the players right at the beginning of the game. Actually, it starts with the captain's meeting. And both officials should be present for the captain's meeting. So that you both can express your concerns to the level of physicality or any particular details that you feel are important. And a lot of times when we have uh, varsity games that are gonna be really, really tight, really, really close, what the officials say at that captain's meeting can make the difference. And if you say that you're gonna be calling a tight game, you want a good physical game, but a good clean physical game uh, and Captains, please go back to your teammates and express what we just relayed to you. Um, that can get you off to a good start right at the first period. But then you have to make the calls. And sometimes an exclusion foul rather than an ordinary foul, we're in a situation where the player just is a little bit over aggressive in making that, that foul, uh, that exclusion foul can make all the difference in the world. It can kind of set the tone for the rest of the game. And even, even if it becomes a situation where the player on defense is just a little bit over aggressive and swings around just a little bit harder, not only do you give them an exclusion, but you give them a man. And that really sends a message. You'd be amazed at it, the way uh, really good referees can get control of physicality early in the game. 
Of course, you can do that then, and it usually lasts for the first period, second period, but then you've got the third period after they've had a nice long time out and a chance to regroup and uh, get ready for the second half. So you have to be on your toes. You always have to be on your toes, but always keep player safety in the, as your top priority. Uh, be confident with your whistle and hand signals. Uh, as I said, player safety, top issue. Position to get the angle. You should be working with your partner, uh, talking at, uh, at the end of the period, at halftime, so that you can get your coverage so that it, it's adjustable the way you want it. Sometimes as a perimeter referee, you might step down and take over the center forward position because it's closer to you uh, and or it's a left-hander and you know that that left-hander can be turning in your direction. And if your communication is good with the attack referee, uh, then you can get everything covered appropriately. Uh, don't make excuses. You know, it's interesting. Um, referees tend to get themselves in trouble because they say too much. And your mouth can be your worst enemy. You should only respond to questions and be as specific as you can in the rule that you applied and why you applied it. I saw the the uh, defensive player grab the offensive player or vice versa, et cetera. And so therefore it was a turnover and exclusion foul, uh, whichever is the situation may bring. But uh, if you make a mistake, you know, sometimes you have to own up to it. You just say, hey, I made a mistake. I didn't see it. But you can't use that all the time. You do that too many times, and then the coach is going to think you're incompetent. But sometimes that's a good way out of a situation. Coach, I'll keep my eyes open. Uh, coach, I got you. Thank you. And saying thank you to a coach is always a good gesture. When they bring something up to your attention, if they do it in the right way. Of course, if they do it in the wrong way, it's a totally different situation. So... That's basically all I had. I've talked too much. Does anybody have any questions? And when you do an evaluation of this, uh, feel free to uh, make suggestions. Uh, and if there's some subject that you're particularly interested in that I can get clips to, that I can show, more than happy to do it. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it very much.